Hello, my name is Matt Foy. I'm a retired salmon habitat restoration biologist who worked throughout my career with the Salmon Enhancement Program, which is a program within uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada. After retirement, I have volunteered with the Fraser Valley Watersheds Coalition. I'm the present chair, and I was always interested in uh, this group because they work also for the benefit of salmon in the Fraser Valley of Southern British Columbia. The topic that I was asked to talk about uh, by a local community group uh, based in the Fraser Valley University uh, was the future of salmon. And I think the request also was, could I think of positive stories about salmon to give people hope so they didn't lose the motivation to keep trying to make things better for salmon in our area because we all know uh, local uh, news about salmon is generally not good and we also know uh, climate change model discussions and how that may affect salmon are generally not good so i'm going to try to bring uh, a broader perspective to this question about the future of salmon just showed this picture of the North Pacific Ocean. For people that don't know, Pacific salmon occur across the northern uh, tier of the Pacific Ocean, all the way in, in, the, um, in the Asian waters down to uh, northern Japan and into Korea, all through China. I've showed the Huma River, which is approximately 3,000 kilometers upstream uh, from the ocean, and chum salmon go up the Huma River uh, transiting the Amir River or what the locals know as the Heilong Jiang River in Asia. So across on our side of the water, uh, I show the Fishing Branch River, just another chum salmon population in the Yukon River known for long migrations up to 3,000 kilometers up from the ocean in the Yukon River. And even farther north, there's now chum salmon and other species of salmon migrating into the Mackenzie River in the Arctic Ocean. Farther south, salmon occur all through British Columbia, chum salmon particularly in our area, in the Chilliwack River, Harrison River, Chequemus River. But even farther south, coho salmon penetrate to just south of San Francisco Bay on the coast, and Chinook salmon penetrate far inland in the central basin of California. So a very large and diverse uh, area that Pacific salmon exist in, and this in fact is what made them uh, very good at persisting for the last uh, four billion years during various glacial advances and retreats. Now add the human, uh, human um, factor into it, Pacific salmon have been transported by humans into the southern hemisphere and have established healthy populations of Chinook salmon in places like New Zealand, in the South Island of New Zealand. But on our, on our continent, in South America, in Argentina and uh, Chile, there is now coho and I believe Chinook salmon uh, spreading in the far south. You go over to the Atlantic side, the Russians brought pink salmon and coho salmon into their far northern waters of the Baltic and in the far north, and those pink salmon now have spread as far south as Ireland and Scotland and England. And in fact, uh, they are moving into places like Iceland and perhaps even as far as Greenland. So the Pacific salmon is now exists in the, uh, in the various hemispheres of the north and south. So their history is not clear what the future will bring, but it's going to get interesting. So here's a little deeper look at our part of the world here in British Columbia and put it in perspective of what I just described with the Pacific salmon's uh, global uh, distribution. So we live in an area that is uh, regularly inundated by ice during the glacial age, British Columbia. If you look at the little map, I've showed the red square roughly where British Columbia is. It looks like it's virtually all covered during uh, glacial advances, except perhaps the extreme northern end of Vancouver Island, 
and it looks like potentially uh, areas in the interior of BC where it's a little too dry for long-term glaciers. So what does that mean? Well, we are, I, as I understand it, we have been in a glacial age for the past two million years with various uh, periods where um, uh, the glacial ice has advanced, as I show in this picture, and there's no salmon, virtually no salmon, living in what we know as British Columbia, except for perhaps those two areas that I pointed out. Uh, glacial refuges, where did they exist during these cold periods? Well, if you look in the far north of the Yukon, those areas are actually unglaciated during this glacial age because it's too dry. And salmon, in fact, existed, we know existed in the north, the northern refuge, and in Asia, which had, which had lower glaciation than Western North America. Now, what about uh, farther south? Well, the Columbia River, the large majority of it was unglaciated and that is our refuge where a lot of our salmon in fact that moved into BC as the glaciers retreated came out of the Columbia River Basin. Really interesting and uh, but it's happened a number of times over these glacial advances. Now in BC little that we understand we think that we've had salmon come from the northern refuge and come into BC during warm phases. An example might be pink salmon that spawn in even years may have come from the northern refuges in Asia. Whereas the odd year spawning pink salmon and many of the Chinook salmon and coho uh, have moved up to the north from the Columbia refuge. Really interesting, uh, but we we must remember that we're simply in an interglacial called the Holocene and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So this is just a picture of what I described over the last, so this is about a million years, but the last two million years we get long periods of cold climate where we have those deep ice deposits and salmon cannot live in British Columbia and then we get these interglacials, the yellow, uh, and there's different lengths and durations. And if you look to the far right, that's the most recent one with the little yellow arrow that we're in today. So what does that mean? So this is what Pacific salmon deal with or have dealt with throughout their history. So it's a matter of them occupying and invading new habitat and then ultimately being pushed out and finding refuge. This movement of uh, fish back and forth has created uh, strategies, each species has strategies to take advantage of these habitat changes. In other words, when new habitats open up, uh, they have to find them, they have to occupy them, they have to overcome other uh, fish that may have, have come into those watersheds before them, or just the physical nature of streams during deglaciation perhaps heavy glacial streams versus clear water streams. And what this really means is that during these warm phases where these opportunities are, are opening up, salmon create very diverse populations. Uh, so they specialize to find a niche in this changing world that works, that gives them life and allows them to survive. And then that collapses down during cold phases. So this species has this ability to take advantage of opportunities, but also to pull back and wait for a better time to move into habitats when they became available. Why is that important? Because when we look at salmon recovery, what we can do in our little backyards, often we're perhaps dealing with salmon populations that are very low abundance. Sometimes in the urban streams, they disappear. An example might be chum salmon. Most of the urban streams of the greater Vancouver area had disappeared probably 50, 60, 70 years ago. Good example would be the chum salmon in the Brunette River that goes right into the heart of Vancouver. But through restorative actions for habitats, overcoming various dams and barriers to fish migration, which probably led partly to the extirpation of chum salmon in the Brunette River. Those areas were restored 
and a chum salmon population in the neighboring area and the Alouette River that was still healthy enough. Uh, some of those eggs and sperm gametes were taken from the Alouette River and placed in the Brunei River to restart chum salmon. And in nature, this is what would have happened. It would have just taken longer. When populations collapse and disappear, it's often this ability to Pacific salmon where the majority of them return to where they're spawned. But every population has a certain percentage of fish that stray. They're not wrong in straying. It is part of their strategy to take advantage of new habitats when they open up. And really all we've done when we use perhaps a, a fish culture program, a hatchery program to restart a run, is we're accelerating that process of straying and bringing fish back in the habitats perhaps they disappeared from. And yet the habitat remains suitable for that species. So again, looking at this picture, I think the message is it's a push-pull from the climate, climate change, and change from any factors, whether it's landslides or human-induced or major fires. These five species have diversity in their populations to take advantage when opportunities to allow them to go back into habitats when they start to recover from these large damaging events. And I would think a major cold period of ice age when you've got a kilometer of ice over your head is a pretty damaging event for a salmon stream. Something to think about and something to give us a little bit of hope that these fish, if we do give them just half a chance, can in fact recover in our own patch here in southern British Columbia. So again, I just want to uh, leave people with the uh, idea that salmon are not going away quite yet. So this is a series of graphs. Just look at the top graph. It's, it's adult salmon abundance in the North Pacific Ocean. So that's all the streams from Asia, North America, that all contribute to salmon abundance in the North Pacific River Ocean. And this graph goes back to 1925. I presume they started to measure these sorts of things, come up with an estimate how many salmon were in the ocean. And if you look at the graph, it's not a graph of decline. Now it does only go to about 207. There are declining periods, but the general trend in the North Pacific has been in an increase. And in fact, we were in, in the period 205 to 210 at record levels in the North Pacific. It's worth thinking about. Now, what are these, these things? Well, the, the most dominant species is pink salmon, followed by chum salmon and then sockeye salmon. And species that we might know perhaps if an angler or uh, that we tend to provide or put particularly high value on species like coho and chinook are relatively rare in the North Pacific compared to these three species. But the message is, is one of hopeful optimism that up to now, the biomass in the North Pacific Ocean is still significant, even from a historical point of view. Now, the question where those fish are produced, are they produced in our area or perhaps areas farther south or north, Yes, that's the specifics. And specifics in our business matter. Salmon, if you care about salmon, you care about them in your local stream. And really that's what we'll talk a bit more about. What we're talking about is in the big picture, salmon are abundant and still in the game. In our local stream, perhaps not so much. And that's where we have to take perhaps some directed actions. So I just uh, cut and paste some of the uh, various news uh, events that have been in, in various papers up and down the West Coast. This is the information that most of us get. So as we have talked about, salmon respond quickly to changes in their environment. They're, they're by their very nature, uh, they can take advantage of opportunity, but by their very nature, when things go badly, they can also go away. They can collapse, but they often can recover within a reasonable length of time. 
if they don't fully collapse and leave a watershed. So giving them optimum habitat conditions does in freshwater does make a difference. But if you look on the left, the blob is taking a toll on Pacific salmon numbers. So what the blob was, was an unusually warm sea surface temperatures in the North Pacific on, on our side, I guess it's the Eastern North Pacific. Um, and I believe it started around 214, it went to roughly 218, as I recall, something like that. Really high temperatures that were really quite unusual. Now Pacific salmon, uh, have evolved to take for, uh, for optimum conditions require cooler temperatures in the ocean. Doesn't make sense. They're a northern hemisphere fish uh, and their food supply changes depending on the temperature of water. So generally the science says cooler water is more uh, nutrient rich and fat rich food items versus warmer water which is poor quality food that decreases the survival of salmon and during these periods, the blob survivals of little salmon in our area going in the ocean collapsed. They probably went down five times, down to 20% of normal, what we would call normal survival. So what is the effect? On the freshwater side of the habitat, there's all these pressures. When the ocean is friendly, the salmon can deal with it and in fact can thrive. But often when the ocean is unfriendly, populations are starting to collapse. It really does matter about the quality of the freshwater to sustain enough fish coming back that when things turn better, then those populations can recover quicker. So again, freshwater has a role, but the ocean often is driving these large rapid changes that we see in salmon abundance. Now on the right, it's just the idea that this is talking about the retreat of glaciers. There's some good news and bad news. Large glacial rivers will become small, clear water rivers and quite different if those glaciers cease to exist in the future. However, often when glaciers retreat, uh, various sections of their upper end of these watersheds become more attractive to salmon and those salmon will invade those areas. So really it's just part of that story that the future is not clear. There'll be opportunities and uh, detriments as these glaciers retreat. Uh, most science probably suggests more, more negatives than positives, but again, the world is changing and we have to consider what we can do in our daily activities that might help these species deal with those changes. They'll have many of the tools they need to deal with these changes, but there is a limit to how many negative pressures we can put on these populations for them to sustain. Or they may just exist to the far north, and that isn't what any of us want. Again, what you read in the paper can be quite uh, confusing to, to all of us, um, but you remember there's five different species there's many different populations. They've evolved to take advantage of changing habitat needs. So individual populations, even in the same species, can do things quite different than another population. And that includes where they go in the ocean, when they enter the ocean, what the age of the fish when they enter the ocean, where they migrate to, where they stay close to the shore, stay local a few hundred kilometers from home, or go up into the Aleutians, or for, perhaps even into the Arctic Ocean. And for that reason, when the ocean has the blob, it matters where the blob is. So it can be confusing. Why do we have a one river and one species showing abundance on the same river? And it's because of biodiversity. And really this is the salmon strategy of survival. It's put by biodiverse populations for the species it's putting multiple bets down that one of those strategies will survive large uh, events that may collapse many, many populations. So here I just pulled this out. They're all from 2022 this summer. The lowest Chinook run ever, no, sight, no end in sight for Yukon River uh, Chinook salmon. Terrible run for Chinook salmon in the Yukon. On the other side of the coin, Bristol Bay, just 
slightly in the same neighborhood as the, at least the mouth of the Yukon River, uh, but a different species, sockeye, they have had the biggest run on record. And all I want to say is, in some ways, people might look at this as a negative. I guess as a salmon follower, and, and I've mean, always been interested in salmon, I take this as an example of the world is changing, and it always has. Biodiversity is real, and this shows in this year, uh, sockeye in Bristol Bay have found the right recipe for survival and abundance where Chinook salmon have. Now next year could be totally different. And that is the, the beauty of salmon and the ability to adapt to a changing world and surprise us all. Nobody probably predicted this in fisheries management. I don't think no human on this planet fully understands and can, can understand the complexity of salmon ecology in both in freshwater and in the ocean. So we're in southern BC, but salmon go a long, long way south of us. And this is just some uh, clippings I took out of uh, central California. The farthest that coho salmon go to the south, just around the San Francisco Bay Area. And I just wanted to point out that they still exist there a long way south from here. And they have some really challenging uh, warm summers, low rainfall events. And I just, just took this out because there's this partnership is formed there between local communities, government, and they really are not going to see the loss of these culturally important fish from their lives and take it sitting down. And I think this is another message of hope that people do have a role in helping these fish persist. We play a role in pushing them out of habitat, but we also can play a role to bringing them back into habitat so they can persist in these difficult times. So not every stream is too warm. Some are based on aquifers. So there's refuges in California that these species can find, but they have to get to them. So low head dams, bad culverts, those sorts of things have to be considered to allow these fish to get to their refuges as the climate warms in these types of areas. One that stuck out in my mind is a recent article about bringing Chinook salmon back above, I think it's the Shasta Dam in the upper Sacramento River in the central area of California. And my understanding is this Chinook run called the Winter Chinook Run uh, existed in groundwater fed streams that came out of a big lava plain. There are all the winter snows and rains precipitated through the lava and then came out as springs in these streams. So these salmon existed in these cold water streams in a very hot environment and then migrated to the ocean in the winter and they actually came up and came through the Sacramento River when it's normally too warm in the summer. They migrated in the winter time when it's cooler and they went to these groundwater streams. Interestingly enough, because they're groundwater and much warmer than surface rain streams, salmon spawn much later, sometimes March and April. Why is that important? When Chinook salmon were brought to New Zealand, they were taken from this stream. And the reason they were taken from this stream is March and April is fall in New Zealand. And that made sense. And when those fish went to New Zealand, they occupied habitat, they spawned in groundwater streams, and they spread through the lower half of the South Island of New Zealand and have persisted to this day. Biodiversity, a new habitat opened for them and they took advantage of it. Now what happened is a dam was built called Shasta Dam to make a large reservoir that cut salmon off access to these streams for 50 or 60 years. And now there's a movement to bring salmon to the upper groundwater tributaries and give them a safe fish passage over the dam. And so they're trying to bring this population back. And they're even talking about bringing some of those salmon back from New Zealand to help do that. Biodiversity, working with, of the species, working with human ingenuity can keep these fish around if we're lucky. So this is another example of the adaptability of salmon. So all the little pink 
and red dots. These are this is the far north, the Arctic in in Canada. Uh, they're finding, and I mentioned the Mackenzie River early on with chum salmon. Salmon are showing up in the Mackenzie River consistently now, both chum salmon, pink salmon, possibly Chinook salmon. They appear to be moving around into the Arctic Ocean. Now, the Arctic Ocean is typically too cold in the winter to sustain salmon, but they believe that there's warm refuges in the ocean, warmer refuges open the salmon are finding. And the land is warming, so these rivers are becoming more attractive to Pacific salmon. Where this will go, who knows? But it's a gain, it's an adaption. This is a natural movement of salmon. It likely occurred during the, the previous warming phases, but we've lost that to our history. And really, we're just seeing what salmon do. They find new habitats that are suitable and occupy them. And habitats that become unsuitable then are simply not used until perhaps conditions change and they can return to their historic ranges into the, in this case, usually to the far south. Anyway, it's an interesting uh, trend over the next decades. It could be that the far north becomes a major refuge for Pacific salmon as the climate is predicted to warm. So that was the big picture. And you know, I have a theme of a sort of positive theme that these fish have the potential to adapt. And the question is, will they? And I guess we'll all find out. But it, more importantly, is our BC Pacific salmon doing okay? And I think uh, generally they're not doing so well some days. In fact, the last few years we've had a lot of bad news about BC salmon. Again, a lot of it tracks back to the blob. But underlying that is impacts of, on the freshwater habitat that have been occurring over the last 150 years of uh, settlement um, have created conditions that just make it more difficult for salmon to persist during poor marine phases. So uh, this is where science helps us understand what's going on and whether we can take some action, collective action, to make it take our impacts off the table so salmon can do what they do that's adapt to changes in their environment and hopefully they'll do better in the future if we take some aggressive action so here's a couple pictures i just pulled out last fall the people in stony creek on the brunette river were concerned about their salmon run uh, i suspect in the next two or three years they're going to be back in a very positive environment i do know is Recently as 214, they had almost record numbers of salmon, chum salmon, in, in this case, in Stony Creek, in the brunette watershed of Vancouver, Coquitlam, and uh, New Westminster. But here's the thing. I did start this discussion that prior to about 1990 or even before 1990, chum salmon had disappeared from this stream for at least 50 years, perhaps 60 years, and they were brought back here. So again, it's a story of return, of loss, return, uh, celebrations of the big years, and concern for the poor years. So this is the nature of salmon in the southern, at least the southern areas of British Columbia, particularly the ones that have been impacted. Again, in the Fraser River, here's the river where a lot of the habitat has been less impacted, although it has been impacted by large landscape activities such as logging and road development and railways. But up to 220, we had four seasons of really poor survivals accumulating in 2020, the lowest Fraser River stock ever turned on record. It did not look good. However, I do recall there was a sockeye inquiry back around 2009 because the second, one of the second lowest runs occurred around then, and there was an inquiry to find out why. Interestingly enough, 2009 was followed by the biggest sockeye salmon return year, 2010, that we had seen for approximately 100 years. This is the nature of salmon. Just when you think you've figured them out, they surprise us, both in negative ways but in that case, in 2010, in a way that no one expected, and it motivated a lot of us to have some hope for salmon in the future.
so going back to sockeye salmon the Fraser River they get a lot of uh, uh, press time because they're a high value fish they support uh, First Nation fisheries commercial fisheries and in recent years some recreational fisheries uh, we've kept good records or reasonably good records for you know more than a hundred years so going back into the 1890s you can see from this graph we had some very large years and interestingly enough it was every fourth year was a big run and all the lakes all the big lakes in BC that sockeye come out of they all had the same or roughly the same dominant year they were all uh, coordinated on the same year so we had these tremendously large runs but then we had very small runs in between in 1914 it was called the Hell's Gate slide a railway was going through a large slide at a very narrow part in the Fraser River Canyon and fish couldn't get through or if they could it was only at certain water conditions the runs collapsed for uh, a decade now with blasting and in in later years I think in the 40s they put in formal fishways the run started to recover but if you notice the boom years of the late 1800s then the poor years to the early part of the 20th century and then about 1970 if you look at the trends we had very strong years in general all through the 90s and uh, a very positive uh, trend and then I mentioned 210 we just had a year like no other year um, and then 220 came or the years around 220 and we just had some absolutely terrible years but looking back we have come from a period of very good years uh, historically for at least since about the 1914 slide so what are we what are we facing how does that look sort of over time so again if you smooth out uh, these returns because the big returns of the 1890s were often on a single cycle year so really big return and a bunch of small ones whereas after the uh, 1914 slide interestingly enough as the various populations of sockeye recovered they didn't always line up on the same year so one lake had its dominant run this year and then another lake had a dominant run the next year but pre-slide they all seemed to be more synchronized so what that meant was we didn't get massive big years but on average when you added up the four year cycle in the Fraser we actually did pretty good and that's the blue line you just take all the fish and add them up from the four year cycle low medium and high and you can see the collapse after 1914 and the recovery through the mid-century man around 95 we were we were really well but then you see the trend and this is a trend most of us have grown up with listening to the last 20 years there's been a slow deflation with a spike in 210 and then 220 an absolute terrible message and that's what has got people concerned about the Fraser run but if you look at it we have been poor in the past and there is some hope that we can have recovery in the future the game is not over for salmon particularly sockeye salmon in the Fraser River so remember I used the example of 2009 a terrible year and acquire into it and then 2010 came away and blew everyone's mind that it was such a large run never been seen for 100 years well last year or 2020 was an absolute terrible year I think 2021 wasn't much better and then what happens we have a near record near record not quite record run for the early part of the Fraser run going up to the Stewart Lake systems they were up almost a quarter, quarter million fish I think their average is 40,000 but we also saw uh, strong runs to the north like the Skeena on the west coast of the island up in Port Alberni a great central lake really strong sockeye run returns double expected I think the Skeena was right off the chart so this is this is again the pattern is just when you think you're out of the game and the world is ending and salmon are going to be gone they surprise us so what 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 do we take from that well we need to take action to keep them around if we can recover habitats of them and lost them due to our actions uh, we're going to have good years 
We're going to have bad years, hopefully as many good years as bad years. And uh, when we get a chance, uh, we can take actions uh, to recover habitat that's been lost sometimes for decades, or even a hundred years. I know on the Brunette River, parts of the Brunette River was not accessible for probably almost close to a hundred years to salmon. And those barriers have now been uh, repaired and fish are using their historic habitats once again. So this is a recent example that I think many of you have heard about. And I've talked about the blob, the warm ocean. We just had an atmospheric river in southern BC, especially the lower Fraser River and up the Coquihalla, that was right off the charts that damaged salmon runs in our area. These are all climate effects, and all the models suggest we're going to have more of them and perhaps more severe of them. But salmon have been dealing with these types of trends for millennia. We just have to figure out ways we can help them strategically using science so they can persist during these events. So an example, the Big Bar landslide, if you heard it happened you know, in the upper end of the Fraser Canyon, Here's the interesting part. It was a large natural landslide. This is something that the salmon in history would have had to deal with, with no human intervention. But here's the difference. We know we've had many, many pressures on the upper river salmon stocks of the Fraser River, man-made, whether it's pulp mills, logging, roads, railways, cities. In this case, a natural landslide occurred and our science said salmon were having an extremely dis difficult time going through. Many of the runs would either have gone ex extirpated or extinct, I guess, another way to say it. Some would have at least persisted in extremely low levels. But we had a choice to take action. And in fact, we had technology to make the passage past Big Bar better. And my understanding, of broad coalition of people got together to pull this off over the last a couple years and for that reason populations that have developed and become biodiverse for roughly five five to ten thousand years since the glaciers retreated we didn't lose them we didn't lose that biodiversity so we could recover quicker we didn't have to go back to square one so again i take this as a positive sign the human ingenuity working with the salmon and their natural ability to overcome these barriers, they just needed half a chance and they'll do the rest. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about, I often get uh, questions from people, I'd like to help uh, the salmon in my area, in my backyard. And I guess uh, the place to start is thinking that there's actually five Pacific salmon species. And as we've talked about, every population has different strategies to survive in these landscape. So, and this biodiversity, this difference between populations, between individuals and what they do, maximizes their chances of persisting as we've discussed during large climate change and habitat variability. What's the definition of habitat variability in our area? Well, I've discussed uh, previously the atmospheric river we saw in November 2021. Uh, there may be questions on the Sumas River and the Nooksack River flowed into Canada and a number of salmon populations were directly affected along with almost every river in the at least the upper half of the Fraser Valley had uh, extremely high flows those sorts of events all five different all five Pacific salmon species have different strategies to survive those events so from habitat restoration you have to recognize the differences between species and population. And I like to say habitat restoration, when it's best delivered, is very personal to place and salmon population and uses the best science to develop a change strategy. In other words, you have to define your target, uh, consider what your options for habitat change are, 
and have some expectation on how that should affect the population, hopefully in a positive way, and use science to answer the question, did what we, did what we uh, implement uh, do anything positive for salmon? So that's the de description of habitat restoration in my world. So I'm going to briefly describe uh, these five salmon, Pacific salmon species, and how perhaps restoration strategies need to be modified depending on individual species. So as I mentioned, pink salmon are the most abundant salmon in the North Pacific uh, Ocean. And in fact, they're the most abundant salmon in the Fraser Valley. The vast majority of pink salmon spawning in the Fraser Valley spawn in the Fraser River main stem from about Chilliwack up to Hope. Uh, in some years, millions of pink salmon spawn in that reach of the river. Now, they also exist in a number of streams uh, in our region. Uh, Harrison River is quite a large run for tributary streams, and another significant run occurs in the Chilliwack Veda River and a series of other smaller streams throughout our area. So the ecology of pink salmon uh, is they're a two-year fish. So if you're if you spawn, for instance, in 2021, you will return in 2023. And they're quite unique and they only are two-year-old fish. They don't have any variation. So really, there's only ever one population of these fish alive. So they either are all eggs in the gravel or fry in the ocean or juveniles uh, off in the Pacific Ocean rearing or adults in the stream. So you're looking when they return at the entire pink salmon population of, let's say, the Chilliwack better when they're spawning. Um, now, we also name them because they're two year olds. If you notice, if they spawn in 2021, they'll return in 223, and those ones will spawn in 225. That's an odd year. An odd year. Uh, now, that's why we call them odd year pink salmon. They're the dominant pink salmon of the Fraser Valley. But interestingly enough, as you move farther north, there's pink salmon that spawn in the even year, 2022, 2024. Uh, Interestingly enough, they, ne they never show they meet. Because they're two-year-olds, they don't intermix. The even years and the odd years, if they looked a lot different, you'd almost call them different species. They don't interbreed. They're unique populations. They may have even evolved from different uh, refuges during the Ice Age. It makes pink salmon very, very interesting. Now, because there's only ever one population of pink salmon alive. So if that the the odd years that spawn in the Chilliwack Vetter, for instance, all the eggs were in the gravel, probably deposited in the month of October, 95% deposited in the gravel in October. Interestingly enough, we had a atmospheric river flood event in mid-November. So the entire population of pink salmon was at risk of being washed out of the gravel during these large gravel moving floods. So what is their strategy to survive the floods? Well, sometimes they can spawn in more stable side channels, maybe protected by large log jams or side creeks of the main river. But the reality is the 2021 uh, spawning run to the lower Chilliwack River, the Vetter River particularly, had a tremendously high mortality due to that flood event. And their number, numbers will get very, very low. Hopefully they won't collapse and disappear, as an example. But as a strategy, pinks seem to have boom and bust. They need to have abundance. So there's always fish go finding these odd little corners. So when floods come along, they survive. Or alternately, if they do disappear, let's say from particularly smaller rivers, the whole population collapses, the neighboring stream may have a good year in the future and there's enough strays to restart the run. So they're quite unique. They only have this two year inflexible, uh, there's, there's not other populations in the ocean to back them up. And I'll talk about the other species. They do have multiple year classes. So if there's a large flood in the river, that effectively 
wipes out a run of salmon during a during a, let's say a record flood event there's actually other year classes in the ocean they'll come back and help fill in that year not with pink salmon boom or bust so our restoration strategy is often to provide stable spawning areas off to the edges of the floodplain that are largely protected from large gravel uh, moving events and if we can do that the population doesn't disappear it's a chance to rebuild as uh, quieter years come in the future so the next species i'm going to talk about is chum salmon very common in our area and i'll, I'll use the chilliwack redder as one of an example but uh, they also spawn in the fraser river main stem but whereas pink salmon may be in the millions they're probably in the low tens of thousands so much less numbers of chum salmon in the fraser men's main stem however in certain rivers they they can be extremely abundant in the stave river they can they can have more than half a million chum salmon spawning in the two kilometers of the river up to the stave ruskin dam so they can be very abundant in certain places on the chilliwack vetter river uh, they typically spawn in the uh, side channels of the river off from, from the main stem. So I was talking about strategies. These fish can come back as three, four, or five-year-olds. So let's talk about the atmospheric river of November 2021. Extremely damaging floods for any fish that spawned in the main stem of, let's say, the Vedder River. Because that gravel was largely moving during the peak of the flood. So where would the eggs survive? Well, this species chum salmon in fact aren't particularly attracted to flowing water as are pink salmon so pink salmon are spawning in the river moving water in a classic gravel bed whereas chum salmon if you actually watch them they're often often tucked along the edges of the river in in relatively still water and the reason they are is they're actually sensing upwelling groundwater coming from below not not a riffle in a stream a moving stream but an upwelling what we would call a spring so they often specialize not in every river but in many rivers uh, Chilliwack and the Vedder is one of the areas in upwelling groundwater so those areas tend to be along the margins of the river and somewhat protected from the worst of the flood impacts interestingly enough if you know the Vedder there's a number of streams, we call them Brown Creek Wetland, Selween Creek, or the biggest one is Peach Creek. Many of them have been modified to make them more attractive to spawning salmon. And they're based on the groundwater upwelling from the Vedder River Aquifer. And in fact, they're dominated by chump salmon. So yes, if you go to Peach Creek in the month of November and you see lots of big salmon splashing around, this is chum salmon. Their strategy to survive is to, to get out of the main stem if they can and hide along the edges of the stream. And because they're three, four, and five in the big flood of 2021, uh, three year olds uh, will come back uh, in 2024, four year olds in 2025, and five year olds in 2026. But likewise, fish from last year's spawn, which was a quieter year, will fill in the gaps left in those years by the big flood. In other words, they, by having fish at sea still immature, they have backup plan for these large gravel moving floods, unlike pink salmon, which truly really put all their money down on a single year. Chum salmon can be abundant. They can have low runs, but they're tough to get rid of, and they're a beautiful salmon of our part of the world. So this is sockeye salmon, and similar to chum salmon, they return at multiple age 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 of return. So anywhere from two-year-olds, which are <clears throat> typically young male salmon, but they're still able able to spawn with females. And females return anywhere from three to six years of age. Uh, but unlike the other two species of salmon, pink and chum, these, these fish, uh, at least 95% of the populations 
uh, need a lake. They rear in a lake from one to two years as young fish. They come out of a spawning area and then they rear in the lake for these uh, one or two years. And then off they go to the ocean for a number of years. So I'll keep going back to uh, the atmospheric river. So if you live in a lake, you have, most of the spawning typically occurs into a stream that feeds into a lake. So the little fish come out of the gravel, just follow the flow down into the lake. This is more typical. Examples might be in, I'll uh, use the Chilliwack better as an example watershed. Uh, sockeye salmon spawn in the in the Chilliwack Lake area in the stream in the upper end. It's called the Upper Chilliwack River or Dolly Varden Creek. It largely comes out of the North Cascades National Park in the U.S. But there's quite a large sockeye run that spawn up there and the little fry just come into Chilliwack Lake. That's a, a, a certain strategy. Now did the atmospheric river affect them? Well, perhaps they're a little bit out of the main flow of the valley. They may have missed the worst of the flooding. Luckily, that population also is an, uh, in an unlogged watershed, which is more uh, tolerant of large floods. But also because there's multiple ages of returns, if the fish that spawned in the upper Chilliwack River, if the majority of the of those eggs were destroyed during the large flood event of November 2021, there'll be other year classes in the ocean that will fill in that year. You'll get a weak year, but you won't have no sake returning in the big flood year, let's say in four years, because of multiple age of return. Interestingly enough, sake salmon have another strategy to deal with these unstable uh, flood events, similar to chum salmon. So in the same watershed, the Chilliwack uh, Vedder watershed, is Cultus Lake. Now the sockeye that live in Cultus Lake primarily or almost totally don't spawn in streams feeding into the lake. They in fact spawn in springs along the edge of the lake, typically at the big deltas of the various tributary streams, like a chum salmon. But in this case, they're not spawning on a floodplain, they're spawning in the lake itself. So large flood events, often uh, the atmospheric river, for instance, often supercharges aquifers. There's a lot of water moving into the aquifers and there's probably some benefit to those sockeye in those sorts of habitats in those years. So again, totally different strategy. They probably did in Cultus Lake very, very well during the atmospheric river. And lastly, there's a third type of population that spawn at the outlet of lakes. And uh, they and the little fry that have to swim up against the current into the lake, and that happens on the Choco River and a number of other rivers in BC. But if you think about it, the lakes absorb the energy from an atmospheric river and the outlets are much more stable. So again, sockeye salmon have a strategy to live in our dynamic world and using the atmospheric river of 2021, uh, these species, Cultus Lake probably did very well. The Chilliwack Lake sockeye probably took a mortality and would have a weaker year, but they will survive and they will get better years in the future. Now, a restoration strategy, what would we do? Well, if we could find areas that we can improve for upwelling uh, groundwater spawning areas in Cultus Lake, perhaps we would look at that just to improve the spawning grounds. The lake itself is quite nutrient rich because of the human impact. So we probably wouldn't look at fertilizing a cultus lake. Chilliwack lakes in a park, fertilizing the lake would probably not be appropriate. In terms of improving spawning grounds, well, they, they exist in an unlogged, untouched watershed. We would not normally so what is the strategy for the sockeye in Chilliwack Lake? Probably just leave them alone and try not to harvest too many in various fisheries in the Fraser River. In Cultus Lake, we know there's been impacts from humans and introduced uh, invasive species. Certain types of water weeds have been in, uh, introduced to Cultus Lake that may be growing into areas that the fish use for spawning these upwelling groundwater areas along the lake bottom that may be putting pressure on the population. So again,
looking at spawning habitat rehabilitation may be an option. Again, these are wonderfully complex fish that have all these coping mechanisms and we really just have to think about how they live their life and see if we can truly help them. So this is a Coquitlam River coho salmon. Looks like a male with the big hooked nose. Um, now they come back at multiple years, but uh, they two, three and four year olds in our area. But typically the females come at, at age three here. Uh, you will get small males, we call them jacks. They, will, can, they can come at age two, but most of the males come at age three. The four year olds are typically from fish that spent more than one year in fresh water. So their ecology is unlike pink and chum, but somewhat similar to sockeye. They come out of the gravel. They don't go rear to a lake, but they rear in a stream or a marsh or, or a side channel. But they rear in fresh water typically for a year. But if they don't grow fast enough and get big enough, they'll spend an extra year. And that's more common the farther north you go because the summers are shorter and the winters are colder so they sometimes take an extra year to get up to a certain size before they go to the ocean they go to the ocean in may at a certain size so the same thing multiple year classes so if there's large flood events using the the uh, november 21 event the chilliwack better there will be other fish at sea to fill in this year they're not quite as good as chum and sockeye because the majority of fish uh, juvenile fish leave after one year in our area, one year in fresh water, and they spend something like 18 months in salt water and they come back as generally three year olds. So they're somewhere between chum and pinks. More of them are focused on a single year of return. So that makes them slightly more vulnerable to flood, the flood events. The only difference though, coho are notorious for moving out of the main stem of rivers into the smallest creeks and often into groundwater areas similar to chum salmon. And by doing so, even in a bad flood year, the smaller creeks are often more stable than the big main stem rivers like the Chilliwack better. So they're survivors. The other thing is they're uh, pretty well found in every flowing stream that's not too warm and it keeps flowing in the summer. So one of their strategies is just to be in almost every little bit of habitat. And what that allows them to do is when they get these negative events like the atmospheric river, there's just a higher chance of survival. Now, when we saw pictures of the Sumas Lake uh, that reactivated in the big flood when the Nooksack River roared back into Canada. We hadn't done that since 1990. They were retrieving salmon out of farm fields. Typically, these were coho salmon because coho salmon are in every stream. And those fish were, were trying to get out of the rapid flows. They moved in what they thought was a side channel or a side marsh of the main river. In fact, it was Sumas, old Sumas Lake. And when they started to drain the lake, they were stuck in the farmer's fields. But in nature, typically these wetlands and side channels is where they do go in large floods just to get out of the high flow and they do quite well. The other strategy that coho salmon have is their eggs actually develop quicker in the gravel than other species, so faster, which means they can spawn later in the year. Now, why does that matter? Well, the majority of coho salmon in the Chilliwack Vetter River had not spawned by mid-November when the atmospheric river hit. Some may spawn in October, some may spawn in November, but many of them spawn in December, January, even as late as February. All these are strategies. The later they spawn, the more likely they will miss the worst of the atmospheric rivers that melt the rain on snow events of December, January, and, and, and November. So again, this species strategy is to live everywhere, to, to spread risk, to spawn late in unstable streams, to spread risk, and to have multiple species at, uh, or years classes in the ocean. Now, what can we do from a restoration point of view? Well, the reality is virtually all the small streams 
in the lower Fraser Valley have coho salmon. So they are a target for just making those streams healthier. Whether or not it's keeping the streams cooler in the summer by simply planting trees, maybe increasing the, the diversity of the riparian or the uh, streamside uh, vegetation, which increases the diversity of food items that feed the little fish because they're rearing in these streams, streams for a year or two. So coho salmon are a big focus for stream restoration here in the lower Fraser Valley. They're highly valued by all various fisheries. Culturally, they're important fish, and they truly are the fish of our backyards, and I like to call them the people's salmon because they're the salmon that many people grew up trying to catch in, catch in their local river when they were younger or even older. So this is a picture of a Chinook salmon. This one is a particularly large specimen in the Calum River up by Terrace. That river is known for some of the largest salmon in the world. It's, this fish is probably over 80 pounds. Uh, they can have a very variable life history. In other words, they can come back as two-year-olds or as late as seven-year-olds. Often fish of this size have stayed an extra year or two in the ocean. Uh, we have Chinook salmon here in the lower Fraser Valley in not that many streams. They're almost the exact opposite of coho salmon, which, as I said, coho exa salmon exists virtually in every stream in the lower mainland. Chinook salmon only in a handful. So the Chilliwack River is one area, the Harrison, the Upper Pit, but there's probably less than uh, a dozen streams all the way from Lillooet through from Hope through the lower mainland that contain Chinook salmon. So they're very specialized on the habitats they choose for uh, spawning. So, but they're a very high value fish culturally and socially and economically. They, they support uh, things like uh, large recreational fisheries in the ocean and commercial fisheries. Uh, so very high value. So in, in our area, uh, each of the river rivers that they spawn in, the juvenile Chinook actually do quite different things. Some, <clears throat> like fish that spawn in the Harrison River, uh, come out of the gravel and head downstream almost immediately like a pink or chum salmon. And they rear in all the little marshes down the Fraser River and in the Fraser Estuary for one to three months and then head off to the ocean. Uh, the original Chilliwack River Chinook uh, were a yearling type fish. And what that meant is they had a life history very similar to coho salmon. They came out of the gravel in the upper Chilliwack River, just below Chilliwack Lake, and they reared in the stream for a full year. Very, very different than the Harrisons. So again, uh, rare fish, uh, valuable fish. So restoration strategies have to uh, take this in consideration. Each river will be very different and the restoration strategy will have to reflect that. Now, how did they do in the uh, atmospheric river? Well, that's interesting because the Harrison River population is below Harrison Lake. And if you think about Harrison Lake is like a large battery, it stored a lot of the water from that atmospheric river and they released it at much more uh, stable and slow rate downstream of Harrison Lake. And that's exactly where these guys spawned. So my guess is they did just fine. Also, we had a relatively wet spring and a relatively long runoff on the Fraser River, which means there was just a lot of water sitting along the margins of the Fraser River in the lower Fraser, below the Harrison. And those juveniles then had, would have lots of rearing areas to choose from this year for that one to three months of rearing in the spring and early summer. The yearling fish of the Chilliwack better. Going back to them, well, again, they spawn below Chilliwack Lake because the Chilliwack Lake does protect them from the worst of these flood events. And then once the flood had passed, they had a year to rear in the upper Chilliwack. Maybe the flood created some landslides and brought some wood down and created some log jams. So in fact, those juveniles probably had a pretty good summer rearing and all that new wood torn from the mountains by the big flood creating this new habitat for the little guys to rear in for the year. We will see. In the Chilliwack, they're very rare. 
the native Chinook of the Chilliwack River. They live only in the upper watershed. There are probably only a few hundred left. Most of the Chinook in the fisheries of the lower river actually return to Chilliwack River hatchery and actually are not particularly viable. They don't produce natural spawning that is, is useful to produce fish in the next generation. But the natural Chinook of the Chilliwack River probably did just fine, even with that nasty flood of November 21st. So again, the restoration strategy is going to be unique, very unique for Chinook by river. And maybe I'll talk a little bit more about some of the works for at least the Harrison River Chinook that's been done here in the Lower Fraser Valley. So again, I just want to point out this is an attempt to be try to bring some optimism for the future of salmon. Uh, they are a wonderfully adaptive fish. They've been here for four million years. They've dealt with ice ages over the last two million years. But to be perfectly realistic on our patch where we live, it doesn't mean they won't go away and can't go away. And if they do go away, we will dearly miss them. So how can we be helped? What can we do? Again, we, I've talked about the five species of salmon, even about different populations about the spe uh, different species. And really, this is how we have to think about restoration. We have to keep it very personal. We have to keep it very local. And we have to take the best available science. Uh, we have to get people talking and thinking before they take action. But importantly, I think where there's actions to be taken, we have to do it because there is no guarantee that in our particular part of the world that salmon will exist in the future. They may exist in the world, but whether they exist in our backyards, that is the question. So I think it's perfectly reasonable to have strategies to try to do directed habitat restoration to give them a better chance of hanging around over at least the century ahead of us, which is going to be interesting given all the models we have about climate change and the challenges of our society in dealing with it in the future. So the Fraser Valley Watershed Coalition is one of many groups in the lower Fraser Valley that are focused on improving habitats with a particular focus on salmon habitats. Now, I've known the group and work with the group in my career. I, I believe they uh, were created around 1997 through a BC Fisheries Renewal Program of the day. And then when I retired, uh, I felt that they were doing good, focused, thoughtful work for salmon in the area. So I became a volunteer for the group. Um, now this group I, I want to. I just took this as a, a snapshot from their uh, website. They break their work into sort of three themes: habitat restoration, enhancement, focus, which I have particular interest in, uh, but also environmental map monitoring, mapping, and maintenance. In other words, understanding what is the landscape we have now, how does it work, so we can take as as I discussed the have thoughtful discussions on how does it work now? What is the ecology? What is the target species and population? And what sort of restorative action should we take? And what would we expect to happen? All these sort of preliminary discussions require some information, some science. So when you do take an action, it has the highest chance of a positive outcome. And that's what I liked about the Fraser Valley Watersheds Coalition. They've always tried to do that as an organization. And then the third link is nobody or no organization uh, occurs in a vacuum. They are part of a larger community of effort. So it's all about this broader environmental education and outreach to allow people to understand the discussions the coalition is having internally and bring it out into the broader uh, community so their uh, knowledge can be integrated into those discussions. And again, the goal is we all want to see salmon persist in our area. We all want to, if we do take action, 
to have it be effective. And the best way to do that is including all points of view and all knowledge and all information and then applying the best available science and taking action. So this is the Fraser Valley Watershed Coalition. I'm just going to talk a little bit more about some of the projects that they've undertaken and maybe link back what I talked about, about various, the ecology of the various species in our area and various populations of salmon in our area. So I mentioned when I was talking about Chinook salmon, the Harrison River population has, has a somewhat unique ecology where they uh, emigrate from the gravel beds of the Harrison River and then the Little Chinook Fry head down the Fraser and then sneak their way up along the margins of the river. Effectively, wherever the tides go, they will penetrate. So if you driving down Low Heat Highway from Mission to Maple Ridge, you might notice you cross a bridge of what's called the Silverdale Creek. Off to the side, various sort of sloughs and channels um, that obviously were constructed. This is the type of project that the Fraser Valley Watershed Coalition has done in a number of sites along the Fraser River and the Stave River. And really, they're primarily focused on these little Chinook fry from the Harrison River, who just absolutely pile into these areas if they can find them in the spring. Secondarily, you'll find coho juveniles and then the various trouts and many other species of, of uh, juvenile fish that live in the lower Fraser. Now, how are these things built? Uh, through a partnership, because everything is done through a partnership in the community. There's communities with uh, the First Nation communities of this area on, on Silverdale. Uh, in this case, some of the funding or majority of funding came from Ministry of Highways that was doing some highways work. And we're trying to uh, have some compensation habitat that the coalition uh, then proposed this site. Uh, it's a partnership with the City of Mission, which I think controls this land, this, this park land. And then Fisheries and Oceans and Salmon Enhancement Program often provide engineering support and design support to the coalition. So again, these sites, uh, you and I would drive by at high speed and may not notice them, but they're occurring all along the Fraser main stem. And the Watershed Coalition and a number of other groups are doing similar projects all the way to the ocean. And the vast majority of them are very well used by the little fish from the Harrison River Chinook salmon population. Just an example of a restoration project in our backyard. So here's a few other examples. Uh, I'll use that Chilliwack Vetter River watershed and the Atmospheric River. If you look on the picture on the left, that's a, a picture I took in a previous Atmospheric River flood on the Vetter. Uh, that's the road bridge heading uh, by Tamahai Creek in the upper watershed. I think the road at that point was closed. The river was making that bridge uh, vibrate like a, a, a guitar string. And uh, I would guess every piece of gravel on the bed of the river at, on that day was moving. Anything that had spawned in that reach of the river was gone. Any salmon egg in the gravel was gone. This is the nature of the streams that we live in. This is the Chilliwack River. Whereas if you look to the right, this is a constructed wetland on the Vetter, away from the main stem called Hoogie's Hoogie Wetland that the Fraser Valley Watershed Coalition, I think is quite proud that was done in the last few years and it added to previous works done on streams uh, like Peach Creek, which is a largely uh, constructed habitat, groundwater fed, Salween Creek, it's various channels that have been restored over the years, and what's called Brown Creek wetlands, are all areas that focused habitat work has been done. And as we discussed, the major benefactors obviously is coho salmon, because these are stable off-channel habitats at juvenile coho like to rear in and coho salmon adults like to spawn in the various creeks uh, streams but in this case it's a wetland so that's primarily a, a juvenile rearing area but the Selween channels and peach creek is groundwater feds also support chum salmon large numbers of chum salmon that did very well in the large flood of november 2021 and interestingly enough because it was a reasonably wet fall 
uh, there was a significant number of pink salmon that spawned in the lower end of Peach Creek, away from the upwelling groundwater at the upper end, but down in the riffles. And those pink salmon survived the Great Flood on November 21st and will form the core of the population that returns in 2023. Hopefully we will still see pink salmon in the Veda River in 2023, partly supported by the fish that spawned in Peach Creek. Uh, we'll, we'll see. But this is the sort of works that the Fraser Valley Watershed Coalition and other groups throughout the Lower Mainland are doing in the streams in our backyard. So again, this is uh, just a, a snapshot of the website at the Fraser Valley Watershed Coalition. Uh, it's just the idea of planting trees. And really when you plant trees, it has many other benefits to just the ecology of the area, to the human health of the area. But in terms of salmon, it's often and mainly focused on coho salmon that live in all these areas. And there's almost an unlimited uh, amount of planting can be done in the lower Fraser Valley just because the impacts have been so high. The second rarest species of salmon is coho. So any tree we can plant across a small stream that supports coho is a good thing. And it's something anyone can do at any age. And the coalition uh, also uses these as uh, events to get people feeling part of a community and help them talk about salmon and learn about salmon ecology. Tree planting is a fun thing and I would highly recommend it uh, as a uh, project that not only benefits the people involved, but also our second rarest species, the coho salmon of the lower Fraser Valley. So I threw this in for the more, more adventurous uh, that would uh, move out of the Fraser Valley to maybe enjoy a restoration success story, what I call a restoration success story. And it's something I've been visiting for a number of years. My son lives in Kelowna, so I just, conveniently always go up around mid-October. So in Penticton, where the Okanagan Lake uh, discharges heading towards Skaha Lake, it's a channel called the Penticton Channel. It's where everyone float tubes in the summer. But in the fall, when everyone has gone home, there's been an initiative led by Okanagan Nation Alliance, uh, by U.S. interests south of the border, and uh, fisheries and oceans and a number of community organizations to get salmon back into that part of the world. And they have something like uh, 27 man-made dams. So they have to come up through the Columbia River from the ocean and then into the Okanagan River it has to go over 27 man-made dams to get back to this patch of river. And then they come to a spawning ground that was gravel placed by this restoration team a number of years ago. And amazingly, you can go there now in mid-October and there's a record run coming our way in 2022, a record run. And how do I know that? Because they've been counting salmon over the various hydro dams in the lower Columbia since 1939. And that was the first major dam, Bonneville. So in 1939, something like 75,000 sockeye salmon entered the entire Columbia River watershed upstream. And that was before most of the major dams were built on the Columbia River. So over the following decades, a whole series of dams were built. Uh, the world got worse. The salmon runs suffered and people got smarter on how they ran dams and they they release more water in the spring to get the little fish out to the ocean. And in Canada, they started to build fishways past various dams that allow fish to enter the Columbia River, go up through Asilius Lake, go past Oliver, go over an existing dam that had blocked them for 80 years into, into Vassaw Lake. And then another dam uh, that at Okanagan Falls, it stopped them from getting into Skaha Lake. They fixed that, and finally they can get into this Penticton Channel, and they're dealing with a dam at the outlet of Okanagan. All I know is in 1939, there was about 75,000 sockeye salmon going over Bonneville Dam, and in 
and in 2022, this year, in roughly in the month of June and early July, there's been 650,000 sockeye salmon uh, over Bonneville Dam, and at least half or more are headed for Canada, and many of them will end up in Penticton Channel. It's a great restoration success story. I tip my hat to the teams that pulled this together. And if you want to learn a little bit more, I've provided a link uh, to the organizers of this talk um, on a little YouTube that shows you where you can walk and when you can see these fish. So the future of salmon, in my opinion, will continue to be heartbreaking, inspirational, confusing, and, and life-affirming, as it always has been. And we know the Earth is facing changes at a rate not seen in the past millenna, millennia. And there is no certainty that salmon can adapt to these rapid changes in our local environment, mainly due to the uncertainty how we people act in that environment. But I'm an optimist. And given, the, given their past history over the last 4 million years, and what we are already seeing in terms of changes in their population across their geographical range, I am betting on them to show us what biodiversity and resilience really mean. And can we help in this journey of certainty and change? Absolutely. But with no clear understanding where this journey will lead us all. And I just like to say salmon have nurtured people across their home range. And since they and we first came to this place, we all now call home. It is now our turn to nurture salmon in any way we can as we face the future together. <laughs>